أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا أهل بيته التيمين الطاهرين المعصومين ولا نتدايم الباقي على عدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الإف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين صلوات عليك بلا We just celebrated the ولادت uh, anniversary of the Imam of our time على حجة ابن الحسن صلوات الله عليه last uh, yesterday and uh, keeping that timeline in mind I wanted to discuss a hadith from Usul Kafi uh, about an event which took place during Ghaybat al-Sughra of the Imam but let me start with this ayat that I recited from Surah Baqarah right in the beginning where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Alif Lam Mim Thalik Al Kitab La Reba Fi that this Quran is the book in which there is no doubt Hudan Lil Muttaqeen it is a guidance for those who have Taqwa of course this is guidance for everyone but there are levels of guidance and especially when people acquire Iman and Taqwa then there is a, a different level of understanding and insight that Quran would give you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes who are those who are known as muttaqeen, hudan lil muttaqeen. The very first quality of muttaqeen is alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. Muttaqeen are those who believe in ghayb. When we talk about this concept of imam who is not hazir, and he is in the state of ghaybat. It shouldn't be a matter of you know, surprise for a Muslim because when we look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the muttaqeen, the very first quality is alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. And when we talk about this concept of mahdawiyyat, especially our 12th Imam as an application of that concept of al-mahdi, this is actually part of the you know, teachings which have been there from before, in the books before Islam, and even in the ahadith of the Prophet of Islam. Means there are unanimous uh, ahadith among Sunni uh, books also, which talk about this concept of Mahdi. So even the Salafi and Wahhabis do not deny this concept. They only have problem in saying that, you know, who is it? Will he be born in the future, or he's already born? But all of them are unanimous, uh, especially in the hadith of the Prophet where he says that that last person, he will be min ahl bayti. He will be from my uh, ahl bayt. So in that issue, there is no uh, doubt at all. What I would like to share with you, because most of us come from the South Asian background, um, you know, there is a very interesting um, event which took place in Ghaybat al-Sughra where an Indian from Kashmir, from a Hindu background, uh, from a very scholar, scholar, uh, scholarly uh, you know, background, went in to search of what is haq and what is the truth, based on the books that they had. And this is where he starts his journey, and this is where I would like to you know, share that with you, Probably, you know, we don't hear about these in, in, incidents in that way. But this is something which very is closer to home for us. Because this fellow comes from uh, Kashmir. Sheikh Kulaini in usul kafi actually narrates this story. Where he says there was a person by the name of, uh, uh, his name was Ghanim al-Hindi. He lived in uh, Kashmir and he was part of the, um, an elite group of 40 scholars who regularly would sit with the king and have, you know, scholarly discussion on different issues. 
And a part of the discussion was that they, and each one of them were expert in one language or another. And this fellow actually knew Farsi. And um, he says, in our discussion, we used to discuss uh, Torah as well as Injil. Um, and in their description about Torah and Injil, they came to the point of uh, the prophet who is known as the prophet of Islam. And so the king basically said, you know, it's important for us to go and find out who is this person that who had been predicted in the earlier books, even in the books of the uh, Hindus. So the whole, the, the group of the scholars actually assigned him that why, do you, why don't you go and travel to the Middle Eastern area and find out. Uh, and they actually financed his trip. And so he started his journey. Now, you can realize, you know, when you look at Kashmir, of course, Kashmir to Kabul is not that far. But those days, you don't travel by plane. You know, so it took him about, you know, gradually stopping everywhere, uh, meeting people. After a journey of 12 months, he reaches to Kabul. And this is where he was attacked by the uh, robbers there. They looted him, uh, almost left him dead. Um, some other people who felt you know, pity on him, they rescued him. And he was taken to the governor of Kabul, uh, who basically was very impressed with his knowledge. And he started having you know, uh, scholarly uh, discussions with the people there. And this, the news reached to the governor of Balakh. Balakh was a more, um, you know, bigger city there at the time. This is in northern part of uh, Afghanistan those days. And so the governor actually invited him to come to Balakh. It was the city of uh, scholars. And the name of the governor was Daoud bin al-Abbas. And he, you know, welcomed this person, Ghanim al-Hindi. Um, was very ho hospitable to him um, and he started you know sitting in the scholarly discussions and then he talks about his own journey and his, his story that why I have come here uh, he says that I'm in search of a prophet who has been mentioned in our earlier books as well as in Torah and Injil and our Hindu books um, so the ulama there asked him do you have the name of that Nabi that you're looking for? And he says, his name, from what I have read, his name is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. They said, well, that's, you're referring to our prophet. He says, you know, but I'll not just accept your statement about it. I would like to go and see him. I would like to see him to see the description that we have in the book uh, about this person fits him or not. They said, you know, he's dead. He died uh, a long time ago. So then he says, who was his successor? And they said his name was Abu Bakr. He says, this is not a proper name. This is Kunia. You give me his proper name. And they said his name was Abdullah bin Uthman. He was from Quraysh, same tribe as the Prophet. He said, that's not the Nabi I'm looking for. Because Laysa hadha sahib alladhi talabtu. He's not the person I'm looking for. The Prophet that I'm looking for, his Khalifa, according to the description that we have, Akhuhu fiddin, was his brother and in faith, wa abna ammihi fin nasab, in family ties, he was, he was supposed to be the cousin, cousin of that prophet. And he was supposed to be the daughter of his, uh, husband of his daughter. And the father of his uh, descendants. And this prophet doesn't have any children, no descendants, but through that person who is his a Khalifa. Now these ulama there, you know what? You know what did they say to the governor? In hada qad kharaja min al shirk ila al kufr. He is he is Hindu, and they say you know it seems now he has moved from shirk and he has become a kafir because he believes in 
what the Shias believe. وَهَذَا حَلَالُ الدَّمْ You know, it's, it's permissible to kill him. And the government, you know, this is where he said that, you know, this is not fair. I've come to look for truth. I have a religion I'm following. I will not abandon it until I'm convinced. Give me the proof. And then I'll change. This is where the governor in, intervened. He said, you know, what he's saying is fair. You know, you have to give him the proof. So he basically then said that, okay, all of you leave him alone. He asked another scholar, Hussein bin Ishqib. I suspect that the governor was a Shia in Taqiyya. He found another scholar by the name of Hussein bin Ishqib and he told him, you take care of this guest of us. Sit down and have a discussion with him and guide him to the right path. And so he started to, you know, sit down with him and he asked the same question. That and I'm looking for a Nabi whose, whose Khalifa is this, is this. And he said, the person you're looking for, his Khalifa is Ali bin Abi Talib. He's the husband of Fatima and he's the father of the children of, uh, the descendants of uh, Rasulullah. This is where then he becomes a Muslim, recites the kalima, and the governor basically supported him financially, took, took care of him. But now, you know, uh, Ghanim al-Hindi now turns to his new teacher, Hussein bin Ishqib, and he says, who is the wasi now? You told me that the Nabi died, the Khalifa that I was looking for is dead, so who is the, the wasi of that wasi? Who is the Khalifa? And Hussein bin Ishqib actually narrated the names of the Imams one after another until he comes to the name of Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Ajarallah ta'ala. This is, the, this, is, this is where we see that this uh, Kashmiri fellow, Ghanim al-Hindi, uh, he says, I would like to go and see him. You said he is alive. I, w I want to go and see him. And uh, Hussein bin Ishqib basically told him where to go, to go to Samarra. And so he, tr he continues his uh, journey uh, from Balakh, uh, crossing into Iran, uh, went to Qom. And actually in the narration, we have even the year he reached in Qom, 264 after Hijrah. And so we are talking about the timeline, if you want. This is the fourth year into Ghaybat Sughra, right in the early uh, years. And, um, and then we see that from um, Qom, he goes to Baghdad, from Baghdad, who goes to Samarra. But he didn't know anyone. He says, so I was just sitting there in a masjid praying. All of a sudden, somebody came to me. And he says, Anta Fulan. He mentioned his Hindi name. You are the one from India. And he says, Bil Hind. Uh, he says, Yes. He says, Ajib uh, Mawlak. You know, your Mawla, your master has called you. Respond to him. So he accompanied him and went, uh, you know, through different streets in Samarra until he reached into a house and there was a garden in it. He says, all of a sudden then I reached to a point where I saw my imam was sitting right in front of me. Salawat Pernayakbar. He said, I sat down and imam welcomed me. Marhaba, ya fulan, used my Indian name and he started talking in Hindi. And he asked him, he asked me, Kaifa haluk? Wa kaifa khallafta fulanan wa fulanan? And he says, How are your friends, your scholars in Kashmir that you are sitting with? And he started naming each one of them. He says, Until he counted all 40 of my companions among the scholars that I had. And he asked me about each one of them. And then he also told me about, you know, the, the challenges and the difficulties uh, that I faced in the journey, especially in, in Kabul. And then Imam told him, Aratta an tahujja ma ahli qum. You have met the intention to uh, go for hajj 
with the caravan from Qom. He says, yes, that is my intention. And Imam, say, Imam basically told him, لا تحج معهم. Do not go to Hajj with them this year. Go back to your city. And, you know, in next year you will come for Hajj. And then Imam gave him a bag of money. He says, this is to take care of your journey. And don't go into the city of Baghdad on your way back. Um, and this is, this is where we see this... Uh, very interesting uh, story of this person coming all the way from Kashmir, you know, in search for haqq uh, and haqiqat, and he had this honor and privilege to see the Imam of the time, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajuhu Sharif. Salawat. What you see in this example is that, you know, when you talk about the Imam, all these issues, the predictions that we have, you know, for those who really are looking for truth, for them, it is out there. You know, it's not that the reality is not there. You need to actually open your eyes. There are many, many people, it would be daytime, if they close their eyes, they would not see anything. But it doesn't mean the day is not there, or the sun is not shining. Of course, there are situations where even if you want to look at the sun, you will not be able to look at the sun with your, with your eyes. But this is where we have to realize that sometimes, you know, when we talk about the uh, Ahlul Bayt and the Fawail and the uh, qualities that we have, sometimes we become very surprised and we think this is ghulu and exaggeration. You know, this whole issue that Imams have the ability to speak in whatever language that they want. We have seen so many examples in the Imam Raza uh, life, in the life of other Imams. And here we see that, you know, Imam is talking to this person in his Hindi uh, language. This shouldn't be a, you know, a surprise for us because he is the Imam, he is the Wali Amr, he is the Khalifatullah fil Arab. And he has been given this Vilayat Taqwini. Nothing is, is a barrier for them. For him to know, you know, what he had done, you know, how was his journey. For Imam even to say that you have planned or had the intention to go for Hajj, you know, with this caravan from Qom. He didn't say anything. But Imam knew. And this is where we have to realize that, you know, sometimes we find these issues uh, difficult. But as I was uh, saying in this speech last night in the, the Jaffrey Center, that sometimes to understand the reality of the status of imamat, we probably have to try to see if we can comprehend the ability and the powers of the special representatives of the imams. You know Nawab Arba that we talk about? The, the four specially appointed uh, naibin during ghaybat sughra They were not only wakil in the sense of, you know, just conveying the messages and receiving, for example, khums and other hukuk. No. They actually were very well, you know, equipped by the imam with knowledge and power and ability. Hussein bin Ruh, the story that I recited last night uh, in, in, in the mahfil. Hussein bin Ruh actually talks about a situation of another traveler who had come from Balakh. Again, a very, you know, similar uh, uh, story to this person, very different of course, um, where a person by the name of Saifari, was, uh, uh, he was a Shia, and his intention was to go for uh, Hajj, on the way he was going to stop in, in Samarra. And so some of the Shias in Balakh actually came to him and gave him the money, uh, the religious dues that which has go to the, to the Imam. And they basically uh, ask him that since you are going there, why don't you take this on, on our behalf? So instead of, you know, carrying this weight of uh, coins, it was easier for him to change them into bullions of gold and silver, different coins that he had. So he made them into uh, bullions there, you know, the Dubai ke biskut jawata. I don't know the size, but something like that. So it's easy to, to carry and count. When he reached to this uh, city known as Sarax, which is on the border of Iran and Afghanistan, um, he actually pitched, pitched up his uh, tent somewhere. 
And just to make sure his amanat is with himself, he opened it, started counting. One of those gold bullions fall down, he didn't notice it. And so he, you know, um, closed it and went away. When he reached to Ham Hamadan, again, you know, because it was amanat and he was always worried. So again he opens and starts counting and he realized one of the gold bullions are, is missing. So he goes to the goldsmith there and uses his own money and asked him to convert that into, into bullions for, of the same weight. And he included that, so at least his amanat is, is fulfilled. He goes all the way to Samarra, met Hussein bin Ruh. He's not an imam. He is not the khas of the masoom. And Hussein bin Ruh, you know, you know, sat down and, you know, he gave him the amanat. And he looked at it. He just looked at it and picked one piece and he says, this doesn't belong to us. This is from your money. This is not the amanat which has been given to us. You lost it in Sarakh. It is still there in the sands. Actually, there is grass growing over it. So I will not accept this. You take it back. This is your, your uh, property. When you go there, you know, look for it in the same place and you will find it. And when you come next time to Samarra, then bring that amanat of the Imam. However, next time when you come, you will not see me. Muhammad bin Ali as Samiri would be there. He didn't name him, but he said, you will not see me. So what, what, what do you see there? You know, when we talk about al maghrib of the Imam, we become surprised. You have this Naib Khas. He is not Masoom. He is connected to the Masoom. But they have the ability, maybe in a limited form, when, do they, when, when they do their function and, and their duties, you know, they have that ability. You know, how would he know um, that which part of it, you know, is actually from uh, the Seifari's uh, own money? And also know that where he lost it and where he should go and find it. And this is where, and not only that, he knows that when he comes back, I will not be alive. And so this person says that after a time when I went back to Samarra, when I asked for Hussein bin Ro, I was told, Mata. He's dead. In his place there is uh, somebody else. And so, you know, sometimes it becomes difficult for us even to comprehend the status of the Imam themselves. And this is where we have to look at the Ashab. If we can comprehend their Azamat and their Fazilat, then it will be easier to understand the status of the Imam who are Masoom, alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat, ایک مثال پہ ہم ختم کرنا چاہیں گے کہ جناب موسیٰ علیہ السلام کی قوم بہت ہی نخرے والی قوم تھی تمام کچھ سوچنے کے دیکھنے کے بعد بھی جو موجزات ہوئے جس سے وہ گزرے ہیں پھر بھی آخر میں اصرار تھا کہ ہم خدا کو نہیں مانیں گے جب تک نہ دیکھیں اور جب بہت اصرار کیا موسیٰ بھی تنگ آگئے وہ کہتے ہیں خدا بندہ ذرا کچھ کرو خدا نے کہا ٹھیک ہے موسیٰ اگر یہی بات ہے تو ہم اپنے نور کا جلوہ دکھائیں گے اگر وہ برداشت ہے تو پھر بات کرنا ہمیں دیکھنے کے لیے it doesn't mean کہ تم ہمیں دیکھ سکتے ہو اور نور کا جلوہ ہوا اور یہ سب کے سب مر گئے ان کے لئے قابل ہے برداشت بھی نہیں تھا ہمارے لیے آئمہ کے خاص اصحاب جو ہیں وہ نور کا جلوہ ہے انہیں ہم نہیں سمجھ سکتے ہیں تو ہم اپنے امام کو کیا سمجھیں گے کربلا کے واقعات میں ہمارے لیے اکثر جو کہا جاتا ہے ہم لوگ جب اکثر جوانوں سے کہتے ہیں کہ بھئی آئمہ ہمارے لیے اس پر حسنہ ہے تو وہ فوراں کہہ دیتے ہیں مولانا وہ تو معصوم تھے ہم کہتے ہیں ٹھیک ہے بھول جاؤ اس بات کو Let me correct myself. تم آئمہ کو چھوڑو. امام کے اصحاب کی تو پیروی کرو. ان کا جو لیول تھا, ان کے جو کردار تھا, وہ ہماری طرح ہی تھے نا. ان میں اور ہم میں کوئی فرق نہیں تھا. جہاں تک ability کی بات ہے, ظرفیت کی بات ہے, قابلیت کی بات ہے. 
اور انہوں نے جس طرح سے قربانیاں دی ہیں کربلا کے واقع میں واقعات میں دیکھ لیں کہ امام حسین علیہ السلام کے اصحاب کے عظمت یہی تھی کہ خود حسین شب عاشور کیا کہتے ہیں ان کے لیے کہ میں نے جو اصحاب پائے ہیں ان سے بہتر نہ ہمارے نانا نے پائے تھے نہ بابا نے نہ بھائی نے اس لیے کہ جتنے صحابہ تھے رسول کے یا اصحاب امیر المومنین یا امام حسن انہوں نے جو کچھ کیا تھا اس لیے کیا تھا کیونکہ انہیں معلوم تھا کہ یہ ہمارا فریضہ ہے it is my duty I have to do it لیکن شب آشور امام حسین علیہ السلام نے اپنی بیعت کو ان اصحاب سے اٹھا لیا تھا اب ان کے اوپر کوئی ذمہ داری ڈیوٹی نہیں تھی قیامت کے دن اگر جاتے امام حسین کو چھوڑ کے اگر جاتے تو قیامت میں اس عمل پہ ان سے کوئی سوال جواب نہیں ہوتا اس لیے کہ خود امام نے بیعت کو ان سے اٹھا لیا ہے ان کا کمال اس بات میں ہے کہ بیعت کو اٹھانے کے باوجود بھی ان لوگوں نے ولنٹریلی اپنی قرآن اپنی جان دی ہے حسین کے لیے اس لیے امام حسین علیہ السلام نے جو جملہ ان کے لیے کہا ہے اور ان کا کمال یہ ہے کہ آشور کے دن جب تک یہ زندہ رہے اصحاب حسین بنو حاشم کے ایک فرد پر بھی کوئی زخم نہیں آیا یہ کمال ہے ان کا حملے اولا میں بھی جو کلیکٹیو حملہ کیا تھا یزید کے گوڑے سوار دستے نے اس وقت بھی ان لوگوں نے روکا ہے لیکن اس حملے میں پچاس اصحاب حسین جو ہے شہید ہوئے ہیں شہید تو ہوئے ہیں وہ اس لئے ہم لوگ اصحاب کے شہادت میں سب کا نام نہیں سنتے ہیں اس لئے کہ کبھی کبھی جو ہے وہ حملے اولا میں پچاس اصحاب امام حسین علیہ السلام شہید ہوئے تھے لیکن کمال ان کا یہ تھا کہ وہ شہید ہوئے لیکن بنو حاشم کو انہوں نے بچایا ہے خود امام حسین علیہ السلام کی عظمت اور قربانی کو سمجھنا ہو بس ایک منظر کو آپ کے سامنے پیش کر کے ہم مجلس کو ختم کرنا چاہیں گے کہ امام حسین علیہ السلام اپنے علم کے بنیاد پر جانتے تھے کہ پانی ختم ہو جائے گا دوسروں کو نہیں معلوم تھا لیکن حسین کو معلوم تھا حسین نے اپنے علم کی بنیاد پر پانی کا استعمال کم کر دیا تھا بہت پہلے یہ آپ جو ہیں جو سنتے ہیں آٹھ نو دس تین دن کے پیاس کی بات ہے حسین اس سے بھی پہلے سے پیاس ہے اور یہ اس وقت معلوم ہوتا ہے کہ جب اکبر آئے ہیں یہ کبھی کبھی لوگ جو ہیں پوچھتے ہیں کہ آخر یہ طریقہ کیا تھا حسین کا جو جواب دیا ہے اس طرح سے اکبر جوان بیٹا مقابلہ جیت کے آتا ہے اور انعام کے طور پر کیا مانگا ہے یا ابتا سقل الحدید یا جہدنی اسلے کی سنگینی نے مجھے تھکا دیا ہے العاتش قد قتلنی پیاس نے مجھے قتل کر دیا ہے کیا پانی کے ایک قطرہ مل سکتا ہے یا نہیں حسین ابن علی نے اس وقت یہ نہیں کہا کہ بیٹا میرے پاس پانی نہیں ہے بلکہ کہا کہ میری زبان اپنے دہن میں رکھ لو یہ ایک سمبلک طریقہ تھا یہ بتانے کے لیے کہ بیٹا تم جس سے پانی مانگ رہے ہو اس کی زبان تم سے بھی زیادہ سوکھی ہے اس لیے کہ حسین نے پانی بہت پہلے چھوڑ دیا تھا یہ وہ حسین ہے کہ جن کے ہاتھ میں ولایت تکویری تھی اگر وہ چاہتے تو نہر القماء کا رخ جو ہے خیمے کی طرف موڑ سکتے تھے لیکن امتحان پر مجبور تھے بیٹی کو روانہ کر دیتے ہیں یہ کہتے ہوئے کہ اکبر تیرے جد آ چکے ہیں پانی کا ایک کاسا لیے ہوئے ہیں جل سے جل جاؤ تجھے سہراب کر دیں گے على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين سيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون خدا وانداء اسخر لبا قبول فرما حمار قناع کو بخش دے حمار توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما خدا وانداء جہاں جہاں شیعہ نالی ان کو اپنے حفظ امان برک جتنے تکفیری افواج ہیں ان کے تمام سازشوں کو اور صلاحیت کو نیست و نعبود فرما امام کے ظہور میں تاجل فرما ربنا تقبل من انکنت السمین علی